The film returns to the castle. The servants are preparing to leave for the tournament. Gaston is doing some last minute training with LeFou and Chip. Maybe some skeet shooting or target shooting. Seems to be difficult. No, it isn't, is it? We better get going while we still have light, Maurice calls out. LeFou goes over to bring Gaston his cape and finds the dandelion. It's still grain, huh? He asks. It is. Not much time left. Maybe a miracle will happen at the tournament, Chip suggests. Maybe, Chip. He replies and hands him up to Maurice to sit with him at the front of the carriage. Gaston gets up on his horse. The food continues talking while trying to climb up on his. Are you not worried? He asks. Hmm? No. Gaston tries to act confident. I'm not finished trying to beat this. And if you can't beat it? Chip asks. Before Gaston can respond, Belle shows up. Then we will accept defeat gracefully. She smiles as she gets in the carriage. No one likes a sore loser. Gaston blushes a bit, knowing he was a poor sport not that long ago. LeFou and Chip look at Gaston. Exactly! He smirks, then whistles his horse, and they gallop to the front of the caravan. All right, we are ready to go! Adam calls, and the caravan heads out. The film moves forward to them arriving at the tournament at the Auroran Castle. In the crowd, LeFou thinks he sees the triplets. He rubs his eyes and then they are gone. He turns to tell Gaston, but then sees that he is far ahead. Come on, LeFou, this way, he calls out. Adam and Belle join King Auroran in his viewing box. I'm glad to see you made it, the king exclaims as they approach. We have contestants from far and wide here. He starts pointing them out. It becomes clear that they have representatives from other Disney films, such as Arendelle, Frozen, Corona, Tangled, Denmark, The Little Mermaid, another French monarch. They are a bit hung up on shoes. We then hear a glass break off camera. Dear, my shoe cracked. No worries, darling. I will have our glass blower make another. Cinderella. Aurora continues to point out more royalty. There is Agrabah. They traveled a long way. Their rugs must be tired. What's your name? Uh, uh, Aladdin. Aladdin! Hello, Aladdin. Nice to have you on the show. Oh, and there is another monarch from Germania. You may want to make acquaintances as they have an impressive mining operation and apple orchards. Snow White. The master of ceremonies for the tournament gets everyone's attention and explains the games. Far from his homeland in search of glory and honor, we walk in the garden of his turbulence. Yeah! 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 The games begin and again Daguerre and Gaston quickly are at odds and start beating many of the competitors except for one masked competitor. Again the first game will likely be shown in detail and then the rest up until the last two will be given in a montage. It will be a series of events where Gaston, Daguerre and the masked competitor are dominating. During the games, LeFou is often checking the dandelion as it is close to becoming fully gray. Maurice asks him how the dandelion is doing and LeFou is doubtful. His last chance is this tournament, he says. Well, yes, yes, I suppose if he does win, countless people will love him. Yes, they will, LeFou replies forlornly. Maurice notices LeFou's grim demeanor. What's wrong, LeFou? Maurice asks. You look troubled. Well, I'm just worried if the spell does break. What will happen? I'm sure most will love him regardless, whatever form he takes. Yes, but will he be able to love himself? Meanwhile, Adam, Bell, Auroran, and the servants are trying to figure out who is the masked competitor. Bell tries to use her magic mirror, but she cannot tell because of the mask. Auroran calls the Master of Ceremonies over, and he confirms that the competitor has requested his identity to be kept a secret. I can confirm that he did pay the entrance fee. Adam is visibly worried. Auroran reassures him and tells him to remain stoic and patient. You got everyone this far. Now trust in your preparations and your champion. There is a moment where Gaston gets hurt but manages to successfully complete the event. 
And now Kane planting the up. LeFou goes down to bandage him up before the next match. That was a close one. I've had worse. Gaston boasts, and then winces as LeFou cleans his wound. I know you have, LeFou replies. Remember when we were tracking that lynx for over an hour, and it turned out that a brown bear was tracking us? That gash did not heal for months. While this conversation is happening, a narrated flashback is given. It is shown that LeFou distracted the bear, allowing Gaston to give the final blow. LeFou saved his life. The flashback fades and Gaston clearly recalls LeFou's importance in the situation. I do remember. You saved my life, LeFou. It was nothing. You saved my life too. Right. LeFou helps Gaston up. Gaston is at a loss for words. What are friends for, right? Yes. That's right. We made a good team, didn't we, LeFou? We always got our game. We still got that Lynx, remember? I do remember. Gaston offers his hand. Thank you, LeFou. The two shake hands smiling. All right, I must get on. Gaston says as they begin announcing the next game. You got this, Gaston! Gaston leaves while LeFou is watching him with a smile. The competition continues on and it eventually comes down to Gaston, Daguerre, and the masked competitor. And it could be literally the Gaston and Daguerre nearly lose because of their rivalry while up against the masked competitor. There is a bit of a three-way sword fight as all three competitors had the same score. After considerable difficulty with the masked competitor, Gaston recommends to Daguerre to put aside their differences and work together. Daguerre is resistant and goes after them both and nearly loses. After some further convincing, they agree to team up. They manage to put the masked competitor on the defense. However, through cunning, the competitor manages to separate them. He finishes off Daguerre quickly, then continues the match with Gaston. Gaston holds his ground despite being outclassed and injured. He loses based on points, but never gives up. I wanted to have a rocky moment for Gaston. Why not? He's got him up against the rope. Apollo, the champion. The crowd erupts with the mass competitor's win. Cogsworth was even cheering for the masked competitor, but then quickly changes his cheering to booing when Lemire, Mrs. Potts, and Chip give him the evil eye. Gaston meets up with Daguerre. We almost had him. I would have been able to make the finishing blow if you hadn't parried when you should have blocked, Daguerre grumbles. Gaston looks disappointed at him, and he notices. Daguerre then swallows his pride. Well... At any rate, you did fight very well at the end there. Shame it was not us at the end, though. There is always next time, Gaston offers his hand. Daguerre looks at Gaston's hand for a moment, then smirks. Just remember to block next time. He takes Gaston's hand, and they make amends. Their handshake is then interrupted by the announcer who directs them to the award ceremony. The three men take their spots on the pedestals according to their place. The Master of Ceremonies announces the winners, starting with third place. It is revealed that the first place masked winner is a descendant of Robin of Loxley. Robin Hood. The crowd cheers. Adam, Bell, and Aurorin come down to meet with the winners. Adam and Bell go straight to Gaston. LeFou and Chip help bandage him up. I'm sorry I did not win, Gaston says. Do not worry about it, Adam replies and offers Gaston his hand. We did our best. We will figure out how to move forward from here. Gaston, though disappointed, agrees, stating, We gave it our all. At least we lost on our own terms. What about the dandelion? Bell exclaims. LeFou pulls it out of his coat. As he unwraps it from the silk scarf, the dandelion, now completely gray, blows away in the wind. Gaston then levitates into the air and is covered in light, similar to how Adam transformed into a human at the end of the original movie. <gasps> Everyone watches and covers their eyes from the bright light. However, 
Gaston does not transform into anything. The spell breaks, and he finds himself looking the same. Nothing has changed! Adam exclaims. Well, he does have a few more split ends, Cogsworth sneers. Did the spell not break? I do not feel different at all! Gaston is completely surprised. What is going on here? What is the meaning of this? Aurora approaches the group. Gaston was under a similar spell to me, Adam explains. The spell just broke. Was it a blessing or a curse? Aurora asks. They look at Gaston. I'm not sure now, he replies. Eh, hey, Gaston, don't you see? LeFou says, coming up behind him. You never needed the spell anyways. You were always going to end up a champion. That's just who you are. He then pops a ball of champagne, getting everyone wet. <laughs> oh, whoops! Gaston picks up LeFou by the coat and stares at him angrily. He then breaks into a smirk and then a smile. Then they both start laughing. The winner then approaches and greets them. There is a lot of celebrating going on over here, despite defeat. Very risky of you competing, Loxley. Aurorin says cheerfully, shaking the winner's hand. You know me. Can't let the heroes have all the fun. He offers his hand to Daguerre and Gaston. Well played, gentlemen. You almost had me there. They both thank Loxley. And you must be the young prince we have all heard about. He says, turning to Adam. Yes, your highness, Adam replies. I heard about your parents and the curse. My sincere apologies. Uh, thank you, your highness. And this must be the new princess. Belle, your highness. Belle curtsies. Not a princess yet. We were hoping to marry after the tournament. Ah, congratulations are in order then. Sadly, I must be getting back, so I will not be able to attend. However, I will send a wedding gift. He winks, then turns to Aurora. King Aurora, thank you again for hosting the tournament. It was a pleasure. And farewell all. He then heads off in his carriage with his servants. Well, tough luck about the tournament, Adam. But why don't you stay for dinner at least? Aurora suggests. A moment later, a servant then approaches the group and interrupts. Beg your pardon, sire, but we have a package for Prince Adam. They see that it is a large chest. Adam and Belle open the letter. Congratulations on your wedding. If you're ever in England, please drop in. We would be happy to have you. King Loxley. They open the chest and it's full of gold. I know I gave him an Irish accent and he's supposed to be English, but fuck it. The prize money! Aurora laughs. Cheeky scoundrel! I must thank him. I will join you. Gaston and Adam get on their horses and they catch up to Loxley. They talk to him through his carriage window and express their gratitude. Loxley smiles. It's my pleasure. The Loxleys have always been a terrible lot since our ancestor Robin. You know, take from the rich and give to the poor and all that. Think nothing of it. Enjoy your wedding and congratulations. Gaston and Adam start to leave and Loxley stops them one last time. Yes, your highness? Listen, I don't know what the future may hold for both of you. But aside from being charitable, the one thing my ancestor taught me is that no one is born a hero or a king. Sometimes they're outlaws. Or beasts, Adam interjects solemnly. Or villains, Gaston interjects as well. Exactly, you know what I mean. Farewell, gentlemen. He knocks on the door of the carriage, and it continues on, with Adam and Gaston watching it go. The scene fades. The next scene fades in, and a title card comes up, stating two weeks later. Two weeks later? Gaston and LeFou are in the forest watching an elk. Okay, there she is. Now be very quiet, says Gaston. Relax your shoulders and take a breath, LeFou says. The sound of a stomach grumbling is then heard. It is then revealed that Chip is there next to them. The elk runs off. Sorry, I'm getting hungry. I haven't eaten all day, Chip says. It's all right, Belle responds as she puts down her bow. We should probably be getting back now anyways. We do not want to be late. We oui. and these bugs are really bad out here. I'm being eaten alive. Oh, I really fucked that accent up. Lumiere says, slapping his neck. We do not want to keep his highness waiting. Honestly, I'm more concerned about keeping Cogsworth waiting, Chip says, and his stomach grumbles again. They all laugh. It's a kid's movie, okay? These jokes have to be fucking shitty. 
The film then goes to Cogsworth, who is looking at his pocket watch. What is keeping them? They are so late. Relax, Cogsworth. They'll be here, Adam says. The sound of a door opening is heard. See, here they are. Gaston and LeFou are then shown sneaking in through a large door. It is then revealed that they are in a church and that today is Adam and Belle's wedding day. Gaston and LeFou confidently and quickly walk down the aisle in matching formal attire. Where have you been? Relax, Pop. You nervous? Not nervous. A groom is nervous. I'm not nervous, schmuck. Don't call me a schmuck, you butt. Fellas, you're in a church. They take their spots next to Adam. What took you? Adam whispers to Gaston. Elk was harder to track than we thought. Of course, do you have the ring? Of course. Gaston grins and shows the ring box. Good. Adam smiles and sighs. He then takes a breath in. What's that smell? Elk pee. LeFou responds. Ah, it's quite effective. Gaston adds. I'm sure, Adam replies. The wedding march then begins, and Lumiere and Cogsworth open the doors to reveal Belle in a wedding gown. Chip is holding up her dress. Maurice is walking her down the aisle. Belle arrives at the altar. Mrs. Potts and Babette are also there as her bridesmaids. The camera pans over the audience, showing it is a mix of townsfolk and servants. King Aurora and Daguerre are also there. Philippe and the dog are watching from the window. Cogsworth is crying. The camera then goes back to Adam and Belle at the moment they say, I do. They kiss and everyone erupts in applause. <laughs> including Gaston. Belle tosses her bouquet and Daguerre catches it and blushes. The bridal party congratulate the couple. Gaston shakes Adam's hand, hugs Belle, and kisses her on the cheek. The foo is wiping his eyes. As he reopens them, he then thinks he sees the triplets again. Gaston then offers him his hand. Le Fou looks up to Gaston and takes his friend's hand. They are both smiling. Le Fou then looks again and no longer sees the triplets. The film then goes outside to reveal the triplets walking away down the road. Well, isn't that nice? Red says. Yes, very nice, Green says. Did you think Gaston would break your spell? Amber says to Red. Who said he didn't? Red replies with a sly grin. Oh, come now, really? Tell us. Green replies. Red smiles and shakes her head cheekily. Well, I still won the bet, Amber exclaims. Oh, fine. Red replies and turns Amber's dress blue. Did you actually think Gaston would marry first? Blue asks Red. Well, you did turn Adam into a beast for ten years, Red replies. What did you give Belle again, Fauna? Belle asks Green. Good question, Merryweather. I can't remember what happened either, Red adds. Her and her father were actually on their way to move to this town. I asked for shelter from the storm, but they had no shelter to give me. Belle gave me her umbrella instead. She was so cute. She said, there, now you'll never get wet. Oh, that is cute, Blue sighs. So, what did you give her? A blessing? Surely not a curse? The camera pans to the shadows the women are casting on the ground. The shadows transform into their familiar shapes of the fairies from Sleeping Beauty. Neither. The shadows stop. I gave her a good story. They all start laughing and they fly away. The end song, Tale as Old as Time, fades in and the scene dissolves one last time back to the wedding. Adam, Bell, Gaston, LeFou, and all the rest at their reception. The wedding party are sitting in a row at dinner among their friends and they are all laughing. Adam and Bell go for a kiss. Gaston puts his arm around LeFou and with a splash of beer they cheers their mugs. The camera pulls back to show the whole reception, and the image then transforms into stained glass. The image then fades out with the conclusion of the song with amended lyrics. Certain as the sun setting in the west, tale as old as time, song as old as rhyme, beauty, beast, and our guest. 
So, final thoughts. Uh, I wrote the story in the spring of 2022. It's been a while. Uh, it took a long time to finish this, and uh, to be honest, I accidentally deleted my entire voiceover for this last episode, so I had to re-record it. So, I hope the continuity uh, is not completely fucking lost. But, after rereading the story while putting it into these videos, uh, there are a few items I would like to address. Firstly, to flesh out the story better, I would include more backstory between Daguerre and Gaston. Just to create a little bit more tension between the characters, uh, give a little bit more stock to like their relationship and make it seem like it's a, like the, the fight between them could go either way. And maybe also like create a little bit of sympathy for the Daguerre character instead of him being a one-sided bad guy. Perhaps I would create a situation where Gaston did wrong by Daguerre, uh, which gives reason for Daguerre's jealousy, and further demonstrates Gaston's development from a villain to a hero. I probably would also include at least one more instance where the triplets are seen somewhere in the second act, uh, just to keep reminding viewers that there's something important about these characters. Uh, lastly, I would like to give Loxley an emblem or a coat of arms on either his shield or armor of a fox. Um, just as a nod to the original Robin Hood movie by Disney. Uh, where all the characters are basically anthropomorphic animals. Obviously, this story is really just a framework. The songs would need to be written and fleshed out properly. Uh, the action sequences would need to be developed. There's a lot of stuff there that could be just said, who, that could be done without voiceover, obviously, or without dialogue. However, I think as it is, it could be a, a 90 minute runtime, maybe a little bit less, uh, which would be in line with the original movie, um, Beauty and the Beast, was only 84 minutes. Regarding the themes of this sequel, the main ones that I wanted to portray uh, through Gaston and through the plot was the importance of having positive masculine role models and positive masculine attributes. I'm sick of this horse shit about toxic masculinity and I wanted this to address that. Uh, knowing the way Disney is now, I doubt they would ever do a film like this, but hey, if they're not going to do it, at least I can say I wrote this one. I doubt they'll do it, but fuck them. And the positive attributes I wanted to demonstrate in Gaston, which would have been a role model, obviously, for Chip, uh, would have been like just his growing sense of responsibility, rational thought, being a productive member of society, and not being a fucking people pleaser. And I think I accomplished that. Um, let me know in the comments if you disagree. I didn't want this also to diminish what was accomplished with the Belle and Adam characters. I thought the character of Adam, I thought flushing him out a little bit more, going from him being a child to being an adult man, making adult decisions, and Belle being a supportive, independent woman who chooses to be with him was important to show. And how their relationship develops even further... Beauty and the Beast was very much a courtship. This, I wanted to be kind of like the development of an actual relationship. And, uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry it took so goddamn long, but at least we got here. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.